All right, hello everybody. Welcome to our last AP Biology Review on Natural Selection and Ecology. Um, these two are really big units, so I'm gonna guess that this is gonna take me about an hour. Um, I am doing a simultaneous Google Meet, so there are students that I'm gonna be talking to. So I've got two computers going simultaneously, so you might hear me having a conversation with somebody um, if they ask me a question, um, or you might see my eyes going to the other computer, and that's just because I've got two computers going at the same time. All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Interrupt me at any time. Let's see, that didn't work. There we go. Okay, so we're going to start with evolution and just remind you um, the concept that Darwin came up with called descent with modification. So when we're talking about descent, we're talking about descendants. So we all are descendants of an original ancestor, but each um, generation there are modifications. And that was Darwin's idea. Um, and he said that natural selection, whoops, was how that process happened. And I thought there was one more note on there and there's not, so I'm gonna move ahead. All right, so there were kind of four steps that we talked about in class. Um, it's nice to have these four steps kind of in your back pocket, I said, um, so you could write an essay about it. But I'll tell you the two most important steps that I want you to for sure be able to mention if you have to do an FRQ that has something to do with natural selection. So the first idea is the idea of overproduction of offspring, that they're making lots and lots and lots of babies. This is where it gets important. Genetic variation, there's going to be different pheno phenotypes among all the offspring. And some of the offspring will be born with what we call adaptations. That's an advantageous phenotype. Remember, it has to be genetic in order for this to really... Um, for it to experience natural selection. Then there's competition for limited resources. These animals have to get food, they have to escape from predators, they have to capture prey, they have to find water, whatever it is they need in order to survive. And then the other step that I wanna make sure you know is differential survival and reproduction. So two and four are the most important. Remembering two and four is the most important. Differential survival, is the idea that they're not gonna all survive at the same rate. Some of them aren't fast enough, some of them aren't healthy enough, some of them aren't um, whatever, smart enough, who knows? Um, and they're not gonna survive as well. The ones that are fast enough and healthy enough, they're gonna leave behind more babies. And so there's gonna be differential survival and there's gonna be differential reproduction. They're gonna reproduce at different rates. And that's gonna allow that phenotype, that good phenotype to be passed on. And Darwin used the word fitness to refer to reproductive success. So a, a, any animal that had good adaptations was gonna have high fitness and high reproductive success. All right, and then just a real quick reminder, um, as abiotic, so that means um, without life, so like um, the water, the rocks, the soil, um, as abiotic and bi biotic factors change in the environment, different genetic variations are selected for. So in this example that we had in class, there were green and brown beetles and they crawl around on a brown um, bark on a tree and the, the bird spots the green ones. And then over time we see there, um, we see fewer and fewer green beetles surviving and more and more of the brown. Um, but then the question is what happens here if the climate changes and mosses and green lichens begin to grow on the bark? You might remember that conversation. So it's not that being green is always bad. It's just that in this situation, being green is bad. If the climate changes, then being green could be advantageous. So species, it's good for them within a species to be diverse. That makes them more resilient and better able to respond when there are changes in the environment. The individual doesn't respond. The species responds as a whole. The individual is just born with the traits that they're born with. Okay, so we talked about some examples of natural selection. This one's actually called artificial selection. Whenever it's artificial, that always means that humans are involved. In this case, humans are specifically choosing certain characteristics that they like. So with the dogs, we're choosing cute dogs, we're choosing friendly dogs. Um, with crops, um, corn, for example, that's the teosinte plant, which is the um, ancestor of corn. Um, we're looking for large kernels and we breed it over and over and over, over generations generation after generation, and it leads to what we get for modern day corn or modern day dogs. Um, so examples of artificial selection include all of our crops and then domesticated animals, all the domesticated animals. 
All right, convergent evolution. To converge means to come together. To diverge means to come apart. So we're going to talk both about convergent and divergent evolution. So convergent evolution is where we have different ancestors. Look at the shark and the dolphin. Remember that sharks are actually fish and dolphins are actually mammals. So they have different ancestors, but they both live in the ocean. And so the same kinds of mutations are advantageous. So they have a tendency to come together and look alike over time. So they end up looking a lot alike. That's called convergent evolution. And you can see examples of, oops, of convergent evolution in all kinds of different animals all over the world. Um, and it would be the opposite of divergence, which we'll talk about in a minute, but it's the divergence is the idea where you have one species, but then it moves, it migrates into new habitats. And when it moves, it becomes different species. That's diverging. Converging is when they come together um, and they start to look alike, even though they are not closely related. All right, now we're going to talk, we're going to get into the section that's on Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and this is leading us up to that. So small populations are usually a problem. Um, small populations usually experience what's called genetic drift. Genetic drift is the random loss of genetic variation. Um, and it's not due to being advantageous traits or not advantageous traits. It's a random thing. Um, and it usually, there's two reasons, two things that would cause genetic drift. The first one is called the bottleneck effect. Um, that's where some individuals accidentally die in like a natural disaster. And whatever genes that they had, they may have been good or bad, they die. And it's not about being best suited for that environment. They just drowned or they burned in a fire. Um, and so you're left behind with very little genetic diversity. That's a bottleneck event. Um, the founder effect is has the same outcome, but it's caused by something different. This is where species move into a new environment. Um, it could be humans. Humans have done this on many, many occasions. Um, or it could be animals that just migrated or accidentally during a storm get blown to a new island or a new location, um, and they start a new population with very little genetic diversity. And so we see um, their alleles, whether they are good or bad, become common in that population. Oftentimes, populations that have experienced genetic drift are not healthy populations. Um, so, and down at the bottom, it says migration or gene flow. So if we can get new individuals into these populations, then we can drive evolution and introduce new genes into the population. Um, so it, there's a, a national park, Isle Royal, um, that's in Michigan in Lake superior. I don't remember which lake it's in. Anyway, um, and the wolf population, they had a wolf population on the island. Um, and that population went from like 50 animals down to two animals. Um, and all they can do is inbreed and they had all kinds of genetic problems with those animals. So the national park decided to introduce new animals. So migration, gene flow, they brought in new animals to increase that gene pool and to increase the diversity. So there would be less inbreeding in that population. Once a population has less genetic diversity, it becomes less resilient to environmental, and I use this word on purpose because I never say this word, but it's in your learning targets, perturbations, which is the same thing as being perturbed. Um, so it means changes. And the, I just wanted to say that word so that if you stumbled across that word on the test, you'd be like, what the heck does that mean? It just means environmental changes. So they're less resilient and they're more likely to go extinct. And we said that about the cheetahs that the cheetahs appear to have gone through two different bottleneck events. And so scientists are kind of like, while we love cheetahs, they are so inbred and so genetically not diverse um, that we think that they're slated for extinction, that they won't be, they won't last long on earth, even if humans aren't involved. All right, let's actually talk about the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Um, this is a little bit of a hassle because this feels like straight memorization. I could totally imagine this being a multiple choice question where they would give you a little story and then you would have to say why it's not meeting Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And you would need to know the five requirements for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. They're fairly straightforward, but I hate real memorization like this. So um, they say in order for there to be equilibrium. Now, equilibrium means no evolution is happening. Nothing's changing. 
So in order for that to happen, they said there's five things that have to be true. The, ma- the population has to be large. Remember in our tiny populations that we were just talking about, those populations were too small and changes are happening. They're, they're experiencing all kinds of wacky variations in their genes because the populations are small. Mating has to be random with regards to that trait. So I think I in class I talked about earlobes. We don't choose our mates based on whether our earlobes are attached or unattached. So that's what they're talking about, about random mating with regards to the trait of earlobes. We randomly mate. No net mutations. There can be an occasional mutation, but it can't start accruing in the population. No migration from other populations. And all genotypes have to be reproductively equal. So natural selection is not occurring. Now, I want you to remember that the whole idea with Hardy-Weinberg is that this is a null hypothesis. This is what's going to occur if there's no evolution happening. Most of the time, we're going to see some natural selection occurring and some evolution happening. This is the null hypothesis. So it says when when the Hardy-Weinberg equation does not work out, when it does not accurately predict gene frequencies for generation after generation, it is safe to assume that the population is evolving. It's not in equilibrium. And, and if we back up, why would it, if you find out that it's in, um, that it's not in equilibrium, if you're like, okay, evolution is happening, then one of these things, at least one of these things is false. So the population is not large or mating is not random with regards to that trait, or there are mutations that are accruing so forth and so on. Hopefully you get that idea. Okay, so Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium provides a null hypothesis. So we did several times a chi-square analysis where um, they told us what the traits were for generation after generation. You used the Hardy-Weinberg equation to calculate the expected and then you compared it to the observed. I want to remind you, O minus E squared over, okay, remember that? Um, so observed minus expected. Hardy-Weinberg gives us the expected rate. Then we do the chi-square value and we look to see if it's a significant difference or not. Um, so changes in allele frequencies provide evidence for the occurrence of evolution in a population. So it's a way of sort of proving this population is in fact evolving. All right, so the Hardy-Weinberg equation, just reminding you, um, I usually tell people to ignore the P plus Q squared and just turn that into a one or don't even write it. I don't care. Um, But you need to know P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared when P plus Q equals one. Um, The reason you can ignore the front half is P plus Q equals one and then one squared is one. So just ignore it. Don't pretend that part isn't, it doesn't exist. So there's a few things you need to remember about what P and Q mean. P is the frequency of the dominant allele, and I chose the letter E because we're going to talk about earlobes. Q is the frequency of the recessive allele, so I chose a lowercase e. Therefore, P squared is the homozygous dominant, the big E, big E. Give me a second. Move my picture out of the way. There we go. So the homozygous dominant. Q squared is the frequency of the homozygous recessives. And 2PQ is the frequency of the heterozygotes. I want to remind you really quickly how to solve these problems. So in this example, it says the question was, what was the frequency of big E, big E in this population? Well, that's really hard to tell because they are... um, they are included with the biggie little e's. They look the same. So there were 200 that had attached earlobes, um, 200 out of 1,000. So their frequency was 0.2 out of 1,000. But there are 800 with unattached earlobes. That's what the big E stands for is unattached earlobes. Um, And we can't tell how many out of that 800 are homozygous dominant and how many of them are heterozygous. And that's what we need the Hardy-Weinberg equation for. We can tell that the recessives are that 200 out of 1,000. We can see them. We can't see the homozygous dominant versus the heterozygotes. They're all clumped together. So this is what we use the equation for. So reminding you, P squared is homozygous dominant and so forth and so on. So we know that the homozygous recessives are the Q squareds. Um, They're the little e, little e, and they are 0.2. And the reason it's 0.2 is that it's 200 divided by 1,000, the total population. So now we can find what Q is by taking the square root of 0.2. If you take the square root of Q squared and the square root of 0.2, you get 0.447 is what Q equals. 
Then we know that P plus Q equals one. So we subtract, we do one minus the Q that we just figured out, which was 0.447, and that gives us the P. And now we just plug it into the equation. I wanna remind you that you always, always, always solve for Q, never for P, just don't do it. Just, there are some exceptions, but we're not gonna talk about those exceptions always solve for Q and you should be able to calculate P from that. So biggie biggie is P squared. So 0.553 squared is um, 0.305. That's when it's a decimal, we call that the frequency. You can turn that into a percent by moving the decimal over two spaces. So that would be 30.5%. All right, right now to the folks that are in the Google Meet, do you guys have any questions? I'm talking so fast. Um, feel free to shout anything out, anything that you want me to go down, go over or slow down on. I had a question about the Hardy Weinberg. You bet. Um, one of the requirements. What does it mean by no net mutations? Yeah, that's a super good question. Um, so net mutations means that they are accruing. It is possible for us to have a mutation, um, for somebody to be born with a new mutation that nobody else has, and it's not. Um, it just vanishes with that individual. So you can have those mutations all the time. But a net mutation means that it's starting to add up. More and more individuals are inheriting that mutation. And it's starting, that would be an implication that natural selection is occurring if more and more individuals are inheriting that particular mutation. So net mutation means that it's becoming more and more common. That mutation is becoming more common. Did that answer the question? Yeah, thanks. You bet. All right, let's keep going, everyone. So I'm going to go back over here. Always shout out to me if I screw something up or if I um, if you have a question. Okay, let's start talking about evidence for evolution. So I'm, I'm following, you see it says the number four. I'm following um, how it's laid out in your learning targets, I'm just trying to make sure that we cover all the learning targets, but I didn't necessarily teach it in the order of the learning targets. So it says number four, don't, don't pay any attention to the number four. Some evidence for evolution, the fossil record. So what we see in the fossil record is gradual changes in structures over time. And that's called, very conveniently, gradualism. And we see these changes occurring over hundreds to thousands and millions of hundreds or thousands of millions of years. I didn't say that right. Anyway, and those um, fossils in between are called transitional fossils. However, it is possible to see a really, really... Um, theoretically fast change in the fossil record. And we kind of figured this out in the 1970s. Um, the two scientists who figured it out, I'm suddenly drawing a blank on their names, um, they called it punctuated equilibrium. And that can be caused by lots of things. Um, we're still figuring out why sometimes evolution happens suddenly. It happens in a burst. But one explanation, it's not a great explanation, but we're just coming up with ideas, is mutations in Hox genes. That would be an example where a Hox gene controls all kinds of other genes. So if you mutate a Hox gene, you automatically mutate a whole bunch of other genes that it controls. They, they respond now differently because the Hox gene has been changed. So this was the example where we had a fly that instead of antenna was growing legs out of its forehead. Um, that would be an example of a Hox mutation and a very dramatic change, in this case, a bad change um, for the fly, but it would it's a very big change in its fossil record, so to speak. All right, so continuing with the fossil record, I just want to remind you of a few things. Um, when you're looking at strata of a fossil, um, of a like a cliff, and there's fossils in those strata, strata means like layers or stripes, um, the things on the bottom are the oldest, and we call that the law of superposition um, and relative dating instead of radioisotope dating. So relatively speaking, the starfish are older than the leaves in the image. Do I have that backwards? The starfish are younger than the leaves. Where are the, Oh, the leaves are at the top. I thought those were leaves at the very bottom. They're not, are they? I hope not. The leaves up at the top. So the starfish are older than the leaves that are up at the top. I don't know what those things are at the bottom. All right, but then we, um, boy, 1970s again, I think, is when we started coming up with something called radioisotope dating. And that's where we take a look at these radioactive isotopes um, that decay like incredibly precise clocks. And so we can look at how much is left within a particular fossil, and we can then work backwards and 
and calculate, okay, how long ago did this organism die? Um, so remember that the half-life, the word half-life um, refers to how long it takes half of that um, radioisotope to disappear or to decay. And so I, I gave the little analogy, like let's imagine I have 10 pounds of carbon-14. That's silly, but I'm just making a point. 10 pounds of carbon-14. Its half-life is 5,730 years. So if I allow 5,730 years to pass, how many pounds of carbon-14 will I have? just five pounds will be left. And so that's what's happening. Remember, if I let another, this is why it's logarithmic. If I let another 5,730 years pass, then I end up with one quarter left here. So instead of a half, I have two and a half pounds left instead of it all going away. I have two and a half pounds. So it, it cuts down um, by half each time. Okay, um, now let's talk about um, kind of just general um, evidence for evolution. Homologous structures, your learning targets refer to them as, very fancy term, morphological homologies. Morph means shape. So, um, and homo means same. So these shapes are the same. So homologous structures are structures that are in different species, but may indicate a common ancestor. And the most famous example are the arm bones in all of these species. Um, they have the humerus, the radius, and the ulna, and the different carpals. And the ones that are so interesting, like whale and penguins that have no fingers and no elbows, and yet they still have all of the bones um, that the... Um, that we have, for example. So it's an indicator, not that we came from whales or they came from us, but that we all have a common ancestor. All right, the next one is the vestigial structure. This one I think is a hard one to remember. A vestige of the past. That might be a phrase that you're familiar with. So that's um, something that we have in our bodies now um, or different species have in their bodies now that may have been useful to an ancestor but isn't used anymore. Um, the classic wild example is that um, whales have a pelvis. And that is super puzzling because not only do whales not have legs, a pelvis is your hip bones and they're specifically for um, they're specifically for holding our legs. Not only do they not have legs, but they don't even have any kind of fins or flippers back there. Why do they have a pelvis? Well, because their ancestors were mammals. These are mammals. They walked on land at one time. Whales never walked on land. Their ancestors were a wolf-like animal um, that did walk on land that gradually moved into the oceans and over time with mutations. Um, mutations that got rid of limbs made them more aquadynamic and they could swim better. Um, and so over time, uh, mutations accrued, but nothing got, no mutations got completely rid of those, um, those pelvic bones. Other examples, there's leg bones in a snake up against the rib cage, um, and then the human tailbone. Humans have never had a tail, but the ancestors, it's the implication is that the ancestors did in fact have a tail. All right. Um, other evidence for evolution is similarities in DNA and proteins. Um, this is a, a, a look at um, the DNA of several different species and how similar these different species are. Every time you see a dark letter, there's a, a mutation, a different change, but most of them are exactly the same. You could do the same thing with proteins and their amino acids. You could look at all the amino acids and you would see that, um, that humans and chimps and gorillas and orangutans, almost all of their proteins are identical, except for maybe a mutation here, or a, I mean, a, a changed amino acid here or there. All right. Um, and then just a couple quick reminders. These were in your learning targets. I wanted to make sure we said them. Um, many, many, many cellular features and processes are conserved across organisms. So conserved across organisms means that they're the same. They haven't changed. Um, and an example of this is the genetic code that all life on this planet, all life, bacteria through mushrooms, through humans, through giraffes, we all use the same genetic code. And remember, that's the the, the letters that code for the different amino acids, we all have the same letters that code for that. So that's an, an indicator of evolution, that we have a common ancestor. We also have some specific things that we talk about with eukaryotic cells, um, some structures that are the same. Um, eukaryotic cells all have membrane-bound organelles. They all have linear chromosomes. Remember that bacteria have circular chromosomes and then they have the circular plasmids. Um, and then they have genes that include introns. All eukaryotes have that. Um, bacteria don't have that. 
All right. Um, and then just a reminder that sometimes we think, sometimes people who don't know better think that evolution happened in the past and then it's not going on today. And that's really, really false. We see it all the time. Um, we see bacteria evolving toward or around antibiotics to become resistant to antibiotics and mosquitoes and other pests becoming resistant to pesticides and plants becoming resistant to herbicides and even cancer cells um, becoming resistant to chemotherapy drugs. The first time we use chemotherapy drugs, they work great in one patient. And then the next time we use them, they don't work as well. Um, you can see it evolve very, very quickly. Even pathogens, and COVID is a classic example of this, um, are evolving and then causing what they call emergent diseases, which are new diseases that haven't been around before. All right, um, quick reminder of cladistics um, and phylogenetic trees, that kind of thing. So phylogenetics, um, they look at the structures in the fossil record and they look at things that are called innovations or derived characters. So these are things that um, appear in later organisms, traits, shapes, bones, whatever, um, that appear in later organisms, but not in earlier organisms. And so we call those derived characters. Um, we could use fossils and we could use just body shapes, um, but for these kinds of clad, um, cladograms and phylogenetic trees, we can also use molecular data. So we could compare DNA or we could compare proteins um, and similarities between DNA and proteins to make a, a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree. And remember that, um, that a, okay, well, I'll say this really quickly. The more derived characters a species has, that means they're more recent in time. They've, they've inherited all of these um, new innovations. And so they're going to go kind of the most recent organism. When they have very few of the derived characters, then they're the oldest organisms, like it's a timeline. Um, and then the cladogram indicates an approximate order of evolution. A phylogenetic tree also shows that, but a technically, now there's, we said there's some debate about this, a phylogenetic tree also shows the passage of time. So it would have numbers on it that indicate how much time has, um, has passed before this new innovation has shown up. Okay, and then um, just a few things to remind you, take a look at the diagrams because they're really important. Um, outgroups, do you see the label letter E is labeled as an outgroup? Outgroups are the least related to the other groups. I feel certain that they're gonna ask you a question about an outgroup. So just being able to identify an outgroup, they're least related. The nodes, um, so where you can see the nodes, if you look on the, on the diagram on the left, you can see the nodes are labeled, they're the little yellow dots. Um, um, the nodes indicate the most common recent ancestor, the most recent common ancestor, said that backwards, um, and then it splits and then you have two or sometimes more than that coming off from that common ancestor. Um, and then also just notice that the trees can rotate around a branch, so look at the right diagram. Um, and yet still indicate the same relationships. And then um, cladog cladograms represent hypotheses. This is how we think it went. This is who we think is most clearly, um, who is most closely related. Um, but as soon as we get more information that gives us more nuanced information, then we change the cladogram. So they're constantly being revised based on evidence. All right. I mentioned earlier, we talked about convergent evolution, which was where you had two unrelated species that over time start to look alike because they live in the same environment. Adaptive radiation and divergent evolution is exactly the opposite. This is where you start with one species. Look at the, look at the phylogenetic tree, I guess it is, because um, it's got time. Notice this phylogenetic tree has some time down on the bottom. It's got along the bottom axis. Anyway, um, you start with one species and they start branching off. That's adaptive radiation. So it says it occurs when members of the same species migrate into different habitats. Different traits are favorable in those different habitats. Um, so those with the best adaptations in a particular habitat reproduce more. So depending on where, whether they moved, whether they were in Africa or sub-Saharan Africa, sub, I can't even see what that says, or whatever, whatever that map says, um, depending on 
understand where they were, different traits were advantageous. And so they branched into and they became different species. And that takes us right into the concept of reproductive isolation. Um, remember that kind of the rule of thumb of what a species is, is that they can't mate with others. So um, one species cannot mate with another species. And that's how you determine that they are different species. So what is reproductive isolation? They are barriers, they're due to barriers that reduce the gene flow between different species by preventing them from producing offspring. Or if they are able to produce offspring, those offspring are not successful. Either they can't reproduce or they don't survive well. Um, so we've got the pre and the post zygotic mechanisms. So just reminding you that a hybrid is a cross between two species. So the classic example is the tiger and the lion make a liger. That would be a, 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 a hybrid or I'm sorry, a donkey and a donkey and a horse make a mule. That would be another example of a, of a hybrid. And remember that a zygote, because we're going to talk about prezygotic and postzygotic, a zygote is the fertilized egg. When the sperm from one species and the um, egg from another species come together, you get a zygote. So prezygotic mechanisms prevent them from ever having sex in the first place. So examples, um, they, they might live in the same environment, but they're fertile at different times of year. So that's temporal. They might, um, ecological is they don't even live in the same environment, so they could never have sex. Behavioral, really straightforward. They don't behave correctly, and so they never get mated with. Um, so for example, birds have very specific songs that they sing for their territories, and if you sing or for mates. And if you sing the wrong song, then you don't get that mate. Um, and then mechanical implies that they physically can't fit together. They can't have sex in this case, um, the Great Dane and a um, Chihuahua. Um, that's mechanical isolation. Okay. And then the, the post zygotic means they are able to have sex um, and even sometimes produce an offspring, but the offspring are not um, viable. So either the offspring die or the offspring are infertile. Okay, and then this was the same idea, but it's got a slightly different name. So it's still about reproductive isolation. Allopatric speciation, there is a geographical barrier. So look at the diagram on the right. Um, and if you go down, there's a river and then a, then a valley um, and the two species of trees form. They don't ever cross pollinate. And so we end up with two varieties and that's called allopatric speciation. And that's really the dominant form when species get separated by a, a physical barrier. Um, that's the primary way that we get new species. Sympatric, I don't know how to help you remember this, maybe sim same. Um, it's when you get a new species in the same area. Um, so they're still in the same geographic location, but um, they are now different species. They become different species over time. All right. And then just a quick reminder, I think this is the end of our evolution. Um, just some stuff about the earth. The earth is about four and a half billion years. They say 4.6 billion years old. Um, life showed up after around a billion years. So we, the earth is void of life for the first billion years. Um, and there's, we're trying to hypothesize, we don't have a good answer for where life comes from. You have studied how mind numbingly complex life is. How does it just evolve? And we're trying to figure that out. We're coming up with hypotheses. Um, so one idea is that our primitive earth has the inorganic molecules that we call precursors necessary to build organic molecules. And then somehow they come together to build the first cell. Um, that's an enormous leap. I really can't stress that enough. That is a profoundly enormous leap right now. Um, the other hypothesis they have is life is transported here on a meteorite or some other celestial event. That's also a huge leap. We've never found evidence of anything like that before, but it's a possibility to try to explain how incredibly difficult it is to get life to arise um, just out of inorganic molecules. And then remember that the RNA world hypothesis, um, we, we saw a video about this, was the idea that RNA is the earliest genetic material. It has the ability to sort of fold over on itself and even to self-replicate, to reproduce itself. Um, again, that's not a cell, um, not even close to a cell, but we're trying to work out these pieces, how this might have happened. 
Okay, um, we are done with that. Any questions about evolution? We're going to slip into ecology right now. Does anybody have any questions before we before I jump into ecology? I'm already at 7.37. I don't want to waste your time. I had one question. Let's hear it. Um, why does sympatric speciation happen if all the organisms are like close together? Because you think they would just evolve together. Yeah, that's a super, super good question. And it's much more complicated. So it could totally be just just giving you a few examples. So it could be um, a behavioral isolation. So you could have the same species of birds in one place, but one starts singing one song and the other starts singing another song. And the ladies are like, oh, I like this song. And some of them are like, oh, I like that song. And then over time, even though they're in the same location, they're only mating with ones that do a specific song. And so there's no real difference between those species initially, but over time, this, the differences become significant. As mutations add up, they're only adding up in one or the other of the those groups, even though they're in the same location. So there's there are several ways that that can happen, but that is um, less common. That would be a less common way. And that's why we say the, the allopatric is more likely. Super good question, Devano, super good question. All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to move ahead. Am I in the right place? Yes, I am in the right place. Okay, so let's talk ecology. Um, the first part of ecology was about behavioral um, ecology. And so we said that organisms um, need to be able to respond to changes in their environment. And we did our pill bug lab and we learned about taxis being um, purposeful movement. A lot of students thought of taxis, that you get in a taxi to purposely go a specific location. So that's purposeful movement toward or away from a stimulus. Um, kinesis is random movement. And then how did we tell the difference? Well, we did chi-square analyses. So if it was random, we would expect 50% here and 50% there. But if in fact they spent 75% of their time here and only 25% of their time there, um, maybe that was significant. And so we did a chi-square analysis to tell that. Remember that plants can even um, it respond to changes in their environment. Um, and we gave lots of examples. I'll just mention two that are in your learning targets. Um, they can respond to the amount of daylight. We're seeing that right now in spring. Yay! Um, the leaves are coming out. Um, so it says the regulation of flowering or other processes like leafing um, in response to photo period. So how much daylight there is. Um, and then there's phototropism. There's also gravitropism. There's all kinds of tropisms. Um, and that's where they grow toward or away from light. So the, the stem grows toward light and the roots actually grow away from the light. So so positive is toward and negative is away from them. Organisms can also respond to each other. Um, so they might have a fight or flight response. We talked a little bit about the epinephrine response um, in our, what is that? That's our, our cell signaling unit, I think. Um, we talked about predator warnings. They might have bright colors to warn predators away. Um, plants respond to herbivory in numerous different ways, like by having thorns or by producing toxins. Um, and they can communicate. And there's different forms of communication. There's chemical communication, like pheromones. Um, they can pee, like we see um, the big cats and dogs, they pee. When I say big cats, I don't mean house cats. I mean like lions and cheetahs, that kind of thing. Um, they pee to mark their territories. Um, we saw ants that lay down food trails to tell other ants where to go for food. Um, and even alarm calls can be um, communicated through pheromones. But then there's other types of communication like um, colors in flowers that can attract specific pollinators or certain calls or gestures. Um, the honeybee waggle dance is an example of a symbolic um, form of communication. Wolf howls are symbolic. Bird mating dances, those are all forms of communication. And then we talked about innate versus learned behavior. So innate is it's, it's genetically programmed and they automatically do it. Learned is due to experience. Um, so they all, no matter what, they have to increase survival and reproductive fitness, those behaviors. And if they don't, they don't get passed on. Um, cooperative behaviors increase the fitness and reproductive success of the individual. So let me say that differently. Cooperative behaviors, when, when like this wolf pack is cooperating, um, that increases the fitness. Remember, fitness 
is defined as the reproductive success. It increases the fitness of the individual when it's cooperating, but it also increases the survival of the population as a whole. So cooperative behaviors are selected for. It's a positive part of natural selection. Examples of cooperative behaviors, you see pack, herd, and flock behaviors in animals. Um, and then we also talked about something, it's got kind of a fancy name, kin selection. Your kin are your relatives. And so that's natural selection that favors altruistic behavior. Remember, altruistic behavior means um, sacrificing yourself to save everybody else. So if, they're, if you're living in a colony and you see a predator, you yell out an alarm call, that attracts the pet predator to you. You could have just gone and hidden, but instead you yell out this alarm call that's considered altruistic because you just put yourself at risk. But why did you do that? Because your relatives live in the colony. And if they survive and pass on their genes, then that trait gets reproduced. And so that trait of calling out an alarm call um, benefits the whole population. And that gene keeps getting passed on because it's successful, um, because they're relatives and they share those same traits with you. All right, um, let's talk about energy in ecosystems. Organisms, whoops, I gotta get my picture out of the way on this other one, there we go. Organisms have to acquire and use energy. What that means is they have to either eat or they have to do a process like photosynthesis or chemosynthesis in order to maintain organization. Remember that we learned the laws of thermodynamics say that um, we're gonna fall apart. Um, we're gonna have chaos unless we keep adding energy in. Well, we're adding energy by eating or we're adding, plants are adding energy when they're photosynthesizing. So in order to maintain organization, grow and reproduce, they have to take in food. So autotrophs make their own food through photosynthesis or um, chemosynthesis. Heterotrophs eat. And if we're gonna say what eating is in really fancy terms, capturing energy present in carbon compounds. Remember, we are carbon-based life forms. The reason, well, there's a lot of reasons, but part of the reason we're carbon-based life forms is because we eat carbon-based foods. So carbon foods would include let me pull it up here, um, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. We don't usually like digest and eat um, nucleic acids. That's not usually considered a food group, um, but the carbs, the lipids, and the proteins are um, sources of energy for us. And then remember that um, how energy flows through this energy pyramid, and it's not an all, at all realistic shape. Um, when one organism eats the other, their energy is transferred from one trophic level, they're called trophic levels, from one trophic level to the next. Um, remember the 10% rule. Um, so this that's why this isn't really a pyramid. It's It's got a really big base, and then it comes in here, and then in here, and then here. Um, the 10% rule is that only 10% of the energy of one level gets passed on to the energy to, to the next level. And that's because lots of energy, lots of animals or plants never get eaten and our, our um, digestive systems are inefficient. We use a lot of the energy, you know, running around and doing whatever. And so the energy that's um, stored inside of an animal gets burned off. Lots of reasons that only 10% of that energy. So what that means is we can hardly have any top carnivores. There's just not enough energy on this planet to support large, large populations of carnivores. Okay, let's talk population growth. And I included this slide. Um, it's so utterly obvious that I was concerned maybe somebody would struggle with it. Um, so how do populations grow? There's just two ways that they can grow, births and immigration. So coming from a new um, population. How do populations decline? Deaths and then emigrations, individuals leaving the population. And then we talked about the two different types of population growth. Exponential is represented by the blue line. Don't worry about reading all these words right now. Exponential is, is represented by the blue line and it goes up and up and up and up and it keeps increasing. Um, that's very rare that we see exponential growth. That would be just very early on in a population's um, growth. And, as, and with time, they start using up their resources. And instead, we see what's called logistic growth, um, which is really that red line. That's a little bit more realistic of what um, happens in most populations. You need to be able to do the math on these. So take a look at the two equations. They're right there on the graph. Um, and I'm going to practice them with you here really quickly. 
So for the for the math for exponential growth, it is just delta n over delta t. So n in this case is the size of the population. T is time. Um, and then R, look at the dn over dt equals R max n. Um, R is the per capita rate of increase. I think you should write that down. Um, listen to what I think you should write down. I think on your um, formula sheet, R is going to be listed as per capita rate of increase. And for me, that doesn't mean anything. Um, so you might want to <coughs> remind yourself that per capita rate of increase means how many offspring per individual um, in the population. That's a different way of saying it. So per capita rate of increase means how many offspring each individual is having. So that's what R is. As long as R is positive, we're going to see it increasing. Higher R values lead to faster rates of increase. If R is zero, the population is not going to increase. And if R is negative, the population will decrease. That makes sense. OK, so that's exponential growth. Logistic growth um, employs a different um, equation. This is on your equation sheet, and you could absolutely expect to have to do something with this equation. Um, so in this case, we're going to take a look at carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is um, notated with the letter K. That's the sign language for K, if you don't know that. Um, and so carrying capacity, in, we have, look at the table, the blue table. It's got, uh, in the blue area, it says K equals 1,500. So that's the um, theoretical carrying capacity is 1,500. And so you have to incorporate K into your, um, into your formula. So if we look at the formula, um, the population um, the, the population change is equal to R max. So um, the if we go back here, just reminding you what it's called. So the per capita rate of increase um, times N, which is the population. Let me get that all written on there. It's on your it's on your formula sheet. Um, and then in parentheses, the carrying capacity minus the population over the carrying capacity. Um, so that whole thing will help you calculate um, your um, what's going to be happening at that to the population at that point in time. Um, so where you are in time, that's how you're going to calculate it is um, for your logistic growth. Hope that made sense. Um, we did a few problems with that. And then it says um, there's two things you need to know about population regulation. There's density dependent. These are things that um, regulate the growth of the population, and it's based on how big the population is. So competition, the more dense the population is, the more um, co competitive it is. Um, predation, disease, remember the more crowded cities, disease spread faster than in rural areas. We saw that with COVID. Um, and territoriality, all has to do with um, population density. Things that regulate populations that don't have anything to do with the population size. Um, drought, that affects all animals and organisms equally, and it doesn't matter whether the population is dense or not. Temperature changes, natural disasters, um, those are things that um, can affect the population but have nothing to do with um, how dense they are. All right, I'm talking fast. I'm trying to get this in under an hour. Um, biodiversity, two factors that affect by or determine biodiversity, species richness. That's how many different types of species there are in the area. And then species evenness is how spread out, they, how um, evenly dispersed. They, hmm, that's a hard way to say it. Um, number of species that occupies each... Uh, uh, a number of each species that occupies an ecosystem. If you take a look at the diagram, I think that really helps. So you've got two communities. They both have the same species richness, which means they have four varieties of trees, but they have different species evenness. Um, the first one has equal, they're all equal species evenness um, or percentages. And then the other one, um, their evenness is less even um, because there's more of one type of tree and less of some types of tree. Okay, and remember that monoculture is bad. Um, the greater biodiversity we have in an ecosystem, the greater stability. So monocultures are bad because we have to spend a lot of energy to keep them as monocultures. They're constantly going to get invaded by weeds. They're constantly going to get invaded by diseases that will spread quickly because there's only one variety. They're basically clones. So we have to spray pesticides and herbicides, and we have to add fertilizers. Um, so monocultures are less resilient to changes like pests and climate change and disease. 
All right, so then we did um, what I think is going to for sure be on your test this year, and that's the Simpsons Diversity Index. They haven't had it on the test in numerous years. Um, so people are, teachers are saying, yeah, it's gonna be on this year's test, who knows? Um, I gave you a link, I'm not gonna click on it right now, but there's a link right here if you wanna look at that worksheet that we did that had to do with Simpsons Diversity. It's intimidating when you first look at it, but it's not so bad. Um, so basically remember that the episode Epsilon, the thing that looks like an E there, that means the sum of, so you're adding them all up. Little n is a specific species, so how many there are of butterflies. And then big N is all of the species in that area, the total number of organisms of all the species. So there were four butterflies out of a community of 5,000 organisms. I don't know. Um, and then you square it and then you look at the number of trees. There were 100 trees out of a population of 5,000. You square it and you add it. And there were, and you each time you add, add, add. So it's a summation. And then you subtract that summation from one. Things you need to know. The index is always between zero and one. That's how you know you've done it correctly. A large value, that means closer to the number one, means you have high biodiversity, that's good. So a, a Simpsons diversity index that's high, that's good news for the, the, um, the ecosystem. Lower values, closer to zero, that's bad. That's more something like a monoculture would have a super, super low um, Simpsons diversity. Okay, quick reminder um, just about the concept of succession that environments are always changing and aging. Um, when the environment first shows up, like after a volcano, no plants can grow there because there's no seeds and there's no soil. So pioneer species are the first ones that get there, mosses, lichens, that kind of thing. They create these soils um, and then that allows, like if birds fly over and poop seeds or seeds come through the wind, however they get dispersed, then they can start growing. Small things can grow first because there's just a tiny amount of soil. Over time, there's more and more and more soil that accrues as, as um, plants live and die and live and die and live and die. And then eventually we have the most shade tolerant species, which are called the climax community. And they live there until there's some disruption. Um, so maybe there's a tornado or a fire or a bulldozer. Um, and then the process starts over again, but it's faster when we have secondary succession because the soil is already there and there's already seeds. So ecosystems have a tendency to come back faster the second time than they did the first time. All right, and then we talked about um, community relationships. Communities, you guys, are all of the population. So a population is one species. A community is all of the populations in that particular area. And we said there were five types, types of relationships. Um, there's competition, always bad. They don't want to compete. They want to have unlimited resources. And when they have to compete for resources, it's bad for both of them. That's why it says negative, negative. Both species that are competing, they don't like it. Predation, one benefits because it's getting food. The other is harmed because it's um, being killed. Um, and parasitism is similar. One is benefiting, the parasite is benefiting, but the host is getting hurt. Remember that symbiotic relationships are super close interactions. We often say they live in or on. That's not 100% true, but often they live in or on. Mutualism, they both benefit each other. Um, so examples were like pollinators and the flowers. The flowers give the pollinators food, the pollinators um, help the flowers to reproduce. And then commensalism is the one that nobody ever has heard of. That's a plus zero relationship. So one is benefiting and the other is unaffected by it. And then I just wanted to mention about competition. Um, that's when I'm going to pronounce it niche because everybody's laughing at me when I say niche. Um, competition arises when the niches of two organisms overlap, when they need the same things. Um, and so we just mentioned here, in particular, niche partitioning is important. Um, so remember that they may have, they may be able to live in a huge area, um, but they have to compete with other organisms, maybe the same species, maybe different species, but they have to compete. And so they partition up the niche um, so that some live in this area and some live in this area. So they don't get to live in the entire area. They have to partition it. They have to divide it up so that they don't compete with one another. 
All right, um, trophic cascades. That was a fun one. That's where um, the example was the wolves being returned to Yellowstone National Park. It's the idea that predators are super, super important in keeping prey species under control um, and that that has this cascade effect throughout the entire ecosystem. And so we've seen that time and time again, how important predators are. Um, we talked about extinctions and we said that um, there's a sixth mass extinction that's happening now, um, but that extinctions have happened on five other occasions. Well, many, many other occasions, mass extinctions. The fifth one was when the dinosaurs disappeared. The one that's happening right now due entirely to human influence. Um, habitat loss is the number one cause of species extinction, but also habitat fragmentation, which this is both habitat loss, this photo and habitat fragmentation when it's divided by roads and the habitats themselves are separated. So it's very difficult for animals or plants to reproduce one another because they're not in proximity, close proximity. Overhunting, introduction of new diseases. When we, when we bring um, a plant or an animal on a ship and carry it to another part of the world, and now it introduces a disease that's never been there. Humans have done that, brought diseases over from Europe to North America. Um, and then invasive species. And I thought I'd just give you one quick reminder about what invasive species are. Um, sometimes they're intentionally introduced because we think they'll be beneficial. Sometimes they are unintentionally introduced. Um, they come over on a ship or they come over, you know, and we don't even know they're with us. Brown snake came over um, onto the islands, the Hawaiian islands on ships, um, and now they're devastating the bird populations. There's not supposed to be any snake species on um, the Hawaiian islands. So that's an example of unintentional introduction. Um, and the two examples that we have here, kudzu and the emerald ash borer, we don't have kudzu in um, Minnesota, but we do have the ash borer. Um, and basically th they come into a niche that is either free of predators or it's free of competitors um, or competitors that can be outcompeted. So they just, they compete so, so well that they become the dominant species, um, leads to uncontrolled population growth and all kinds of changes in an ecosystem. We also talked about um, how we can sometimes, how humans, um, even unintentionally, we can disrupt a habitat. Um, in the example here, this was off the coast of California, we overfished and that led to a huge series of events, eventually leading to the death and the decline of the sea otter. Um, and the sea otter was a keystone species in that um, environment. They had, nobody else had their role. Um, nobody else else did what they did. And the important thing that they were doing was keeping the sea urchin population under control. And when the sea otter population declined, um, suddenly the sea urchin population went crazy and then the kelp forests vanished and blah, blah, blah. Keystone species, a species whose presence is super important, more important perhaps than the other species. So when they go away, um, we see a lot of chaos. We are almost done, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just wanted to wrap up by reminding you that there are things that um, we are impacting across the planet, um, biogeochemical cycles. Um, so the first cycle is the carbon cycle, and you guys are pretty familiar with that. Um, as we burn fossil fuels, as we burn anything, if we burn a forest, if we smoke a cigarette, if we burn fossil fuels, it doesn't matter. Burn leaves in our backyard. Um, we're adding carbon dioxide to the air. And a little bit of that's not a problem, but we're doing it across the planet and we're burning down our rainforest. So we're adding carbon dioxide and then we're getting rid of the very things, the trees that would pull that carbon dioxide out of the air. Um, so right now we have too much carbon dioxide in the air. It's acting like a blanket and that's one of our primary greenhouse gases that's heating up the planet. Um, the nitrogen cycle um, is determined by bacteria, soil bacteria. Um, they're the ones that um, put nitrogen in the air in the first place, and they're also the ones that pull nitrogen out of the air. The question is, what role is antibiotics having on those bacteria? Are we uh, damaging our soil bacteria as, we, um, as more and more antibiotics end up in the environment? 
that's still to be determined. And then the phosphorus cycle, these are just three examples. There's many more. Um, the phosphorus exa example, you don't need to know the details of this cycle or any of the cycles. You don't need to know the details. That's environmental. That's AP environmental. Um, but just the idea that when we have fertilizers, oftentimes they wash into our waterways. And if they have phosphorus in them, they lead to a cascade of events. I keep saying the word cascade, cascade of events that leads to the death of lakes and the death of fish. So plants grow initially and then they die. Decomposers come in, fish start running out of air, they die, it stinks, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's part of why phosphorus is illegal now in Minnesota in our, um, in our non-commercial fertilizers. Um, it is important that you understand that not everything that happens on this planet is due to humans. So geological disruptions happen and we have no control over those. Those are normal. So volcanoes spew an enormous amount of carbon dioxide into the air. Um, it's really a bummer every time there's a volcano when we already know that this planet is um, experiencing global warming and too high carbon dioxide levels. And then volcanoes happen and just um, contribute more to the problem. Um, but just be aware that um, we're not the only ones that are adding that carbon dioxide. And then the last thing that we'll just remind you of is just global warming, that um, carbon dioxide and methane levels in particular have increased so much um, over the last 100 years. Um, temperatures on the planet are increasing. 2021, that was last year, um, tied for the sixth warmest year on record. Um, and so we're trying to limit the increase of the temperatures just to two degrees. Um, we don't want to go any higher than two degrees. One and a half degrees would be best if we could keep that and then lower. Um, levels of greenhouse gases are increased, especially due to carbon dioxide and methane. Methane um, comes from oil and gas, the burning of oil and gas. Livestock, remember cow farts is where um, methane comes from. Landfills, um, that's human again, but then also naturally from wetlands and geothermal sources. Oh my gosh, everybody, that is it. I will pause one more time for questions. What time is it? How did I do? 8.03. That wasn't so bad. I was trying to get you out here at 8. Any questions before we go? All right, cuties. Um, I hope you guys all have a fabulous night. I hope you all wished your um, moms a happy Mother's Day. Um, and I will see you tomorrow. And let me know if you need anything else. Peace. Thank you. You betcha. Thanks, Sophia. Thanks.